Tonight on Let It Rip, the citizens of Detroit have a right to a city government that is free of corruption. The homes and offices of two more Detroit City Council members raided by the FBI. Could criminal charges be next? And what impact could the investigation itself have on the November election? But first. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. An emotional President Joe Biden vows to retaliate for the suicide bombing at the Kabul airport that killed at least a dozen U.S. service members and more than 60 Afghans. But he also admits that more of our troops could die before all Americans can get out of the country. Time to let it rip on the panel tonight. Lawyer, professor, retired brigadier general, and an expert in homeland security and counterterrorism, Michael McDaniels, back. Along with an expert in catching the bad guys, whether it's a crooked politician or religious fanatic, he's the retired special agent in charge of the FBI in Detroit, and the arena is here. Plus, Professor Saeed Khan, an expert on Asian and Near East studies from Wayne State University, and as always, anchor attorney Charlie Langton. But we begin tonight with Terry Font, who actually served in Afghanistan, was awarded the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star, and who just a few years ago was in the room helping to advise then-President Arash Ghani, the same Afghan president who fled the country as the Taliban took over. Jerry, I know you feel the loss of those 12 brave Americans killed a lot more than anyone else on the panel tonight, but how do you stop a man-man who's willing to kill himself just to kill you? What should we be doing now? Obviously, uh, if we're gonna get every U.S. citizen out of there, we need to put the force necessary in there to do that. Uh, and that means all the enablers, um, whether it be air cover, uh, whatever it be, to take care uh, and get every American out of there. I'm an Army Ranger. Never leave a fallen comrade to fall in the hands of the enemy and under no circumstances ever embarrass your country. Uh, it's time to take the gloves off. We have U.S. citizens there. We declared our, our desire to just get U.S. citizens out and the Afghan partners who work with us and the, the Taliban have agreed with that. Um, Understand the timeline that's on the on the president's decision, but uh, it's it's time to get him out and do whatever's necessary to do so. General, what's happened is horrible. Twelve Americans dead, more than sixty Afghans killed, including children. But we've airlifted more than a hundred thousand people out of the country. But continuing that evacuation is risking even more lives. So, what's the answer? Well, I think we have to continue the mission. Uh, we, we don't stop now. We're not going to be deterred by a terrorist attack, as awful as it was, uh, uh, for the United States, for those 12 Marines and their families, and for all their comrades as well. Uh, we have a mission to continue. Uh, we've done this before. We need to continue to do it. Uh, Non-combatant evacuation operations are a very tricky m mission, as I think Jerry was, was referring to. Uh, we, we have to continue what we're doing. Uh, I do agree we're going to have to uh, in, in, in forcing enlarge the perimeter. Uh, obviously, it didn't work. Uh, and we're also going to have to probably increase uh, um, militarized or uh, and or CIA evacuation assistance to the airport itself. Uh, both of those are sort of anti-terror uh, uh, missions. They're defensive missions, but the chances are large that we will have further casualties as a result of that. And that's even before uh, we consider some sort of counterterrorism uh, mission there. Meanwhile, Professor Khan, the president said today that a group called ISIS-K is behind the deadly attack today, and he vowed to hunt them down. But who are they? And how do we know they're not working with the Taliban? Well, ISIS-K, the K stands for the Khorasan province, which uh, comprises the area of Afghanistan and Pakistan. So essentially, we have to see ISIS-K as a franchisee of... Uh, of the broader ISIS project that has been underway uh, for the last seven years in the Middle East. Now, as far as the question about uh, trust uh, regarding the Taliban, well, these two groups are actually not just rivals, but now arch rivals. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, as uh, terrible as the carnage was uh, today in Kabul, uh, the real target uh, of ISIS-K was actually the Taliban. Uh, to expose uh, their weakness uh, and uh, their inability to uh, provide security at Kabul airport. And for an organization that is craving uh, respectability and legitimacy as being the, uh, the new 
uh, regime in power in Kabul, uh, this is a devastating uh, hit to their uh, uh, credibility and their reputation. Meanwhile, Andy, for years, uh, we've been relatively lucky. There's been a lot of pain and suffering overseas, but so far no massive terror attacks on U.S. soil recently. But are you now concerned that the terrorists will all crowd into Afghanistan and start planning another 9-11? You know, Huel, from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan on Christmas Day of 1979 until uh, the attacks of September 11, 2001, Afghanistan has been a training uh, breeding ground for, for radical Sunni extremism. And so these, these individuals, these groups now have a safe haven again. Professor Khan is exactly right. The, the saving grace is a lot of these groups hate each other, right? They have egos, they have different missions, they have different vision. Um, but there are going to be some like-minded. You know, Al Qaeda is not gone. They're 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 hurt, they're wounded, but they're still out there. So there are some groups that that uh, the Taliban is going to be able to to work with, and they're going to have a safe safe haven to train, indoctrinate, radicalize a whole other generation of terrorists. And Charlie, let me bring you into this discussion because as it stands, does getting out of Af Afghanistan mean we've got to send in even more troops to get the job done? And does it mean really getting tough and fighting with everything we have? And will the American public tolerate the endless cycle of troop drawdowns and troop searches? I don't know. Well, I, I'll tell you what I heard about uh, service people being killed today in Afghanistan. I think that sent a, a rally call to this country for the maybe the first time we really said, wait a minute, what is going on in Afghanistan? What is is the real purpose of Afghanistan, and how can we end this war without killing, with more killing? And to me, it seems that if we withdrew troops that should have been there to protect the airport, to allow the people to get out, something was wrong there. And if we're gonna make a deal with the Taliban, which I guess we did, maybe we had to, I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but if we're gonna make a deal with the Taliban, we better have some enforcement ready troops ready to make sure that we can, in fact, get out of this country safely. I'm not so sure that happened here. Well, if, if I may, is that, you know, General McDaniel mentioned uh, a NEO, a non-combatant evacuation operation. That's true. The lead department for that is State Department, but the primary support department is Department of Defense. And one of the, you know, it's been, it's been rehearsed for years. I've been on multiple exercises in Korea. If there is an outbreak of a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, the first thing that happens is a non-combatant evacuation operation before U.S. forces actually crank up very much. They leave it to the, the South Koreans. You know, doctrinally, it should have been, let's do the non-combatant evacuation operation while we still had the, the military footprint there to be able to support that, and DOD was there to be able to support that. There, When they saw the the, the precipitous fall of province, provincial capitals, that, that was time for people to start taking note and paying more attention to say, is this not time to trigger a NEO? And that would have been a call of the, the ambassador to the State Department on the ground in Afghanistan. But Jerry, you were in the room with Ashraf Ghani. I mean, you spoke with this man. Were you surprised at how quickly he fled the country? You know, um, he was, a, he was on the World Bank. He's a very urbane and educated man, but uh, he also uh, is a very wanted man, probably also. Um, I mean, the stands that he took and how many times he was targeted himself by the Taliban. I mean, I was present the night where the, uh, the governor's office in Kandahar was bombed and uh, President Ghani summoned uh, UK Ambassador Jeremy, uh, U.S. Ambassador Hugo Lawrence, General Haas, and myself, and we sat at a table, just for a very small, intimate table, and uh, we had to talk him out of declaring war on Pakistan. We didn't know what Minister Stanek Zai, who was the uh, minister for the National Director of Security, kind of a combination of the FBI and CIA in Afghanistan, we didn't know what he knew. We did know what we knew and knew, and uh, it was a, a little game of chicken to prevent that. So he's not afraid of that. He wasn't afraid to take them on. And uh, was I was I surprised a, a little bit heartfelt, uh, broken a little bit. But I mean, I understand in his position, um, uh, you know, I don't know that uh, he had too many options. The, the other question, too, is where's where's Ham Hamid Karzai right now? Where is he? And is look, he? are we go ahead? Well, when when uh, when he had left office, he still retained a uh, president emeritus 
uh, residents on the compound there for, protect, for, for protection reasons. Well, look, are, are we being real with ourselves about what this is going to take? We know that these terrorist groups respond to power. If indeed they want to show how strong they are by attacking us, is it time for America to really get tough? To put in the kind of operation that will essentially wipe these people off the face of the earth? Is it possible and are we willing to do that? I'm smiling here because we already did that. And, uh, you know, you can uh, you, you can stamp them out and they come back. You know, it's uh, it's hard to kill an ideology. It's hard to kill a terrorist organization that's based upon an ideology like this. Uh, I, I I think the decision was made by this administration, the previous one, that the American public wouldn't tolerate this. Uh, and they they bent to the, the, the public will here, uh, perhaps. Uh, and, and I'm putting, I, admittedly, putting a, a good face on this. You know, I, I'm waiting for an author to write a book that like H.R. McMaster did um, with regard to Vietnam. Dereliction of duty. When you really look at this is, is that it's a lot of failed policy. I mean, the policy that prevented us from killing the Taliban unless they were di directly participating in hostilities, DPIH. I mean, I sat there watching drone feed with 100 Taliban fighters in Baramchar right across the border from uh, Pakistan in Kandahar province. We couldn't touch them. Took drone video of it, uh, got some facial recognition on them, saw the same fighters through facial recognition six weeks later in Sangin. If your war is not a pretty business. So until you're, pre until you're prepared to fight a war, which is not a pretty business, then you shouldn't send the U.S. military to do it. And I, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of policies that really hamstrung and tied the hands of the U.S. military in Afghanistan. And I think a review of this war, this long war, will reveal that. But realizing, too, that when we become the big person on the playing field, the big bully, that in our effort to win, we sometimes have to kill innocent women and children ourselves. And I don't know if America is ready for that. You know, again, war is not a clean thing. The last time that we, we conducted a declared war was World War II. Everything else has been by uh, executive order and consent of, of Congress through various laws, but not through a, a clear declaration, declaration of war. So it's not pretty, but you know, we killed a lot of innocent civilians in, in Germany and Japan during World War II. It's not a clean business. It's, it's unfortunate, but you know, but did, but did anybody think of the Afghan people that helped us through all these years? Did anybody think that we're going to have to get not only our own Americans out of there, but the people that helped us in Afghanistan? And all these negotiations with the Taliban, did that ever come up that a lot of the people from Afghanistan would be leaving? Would that cause any trouble? We have to have seen this. Well, look, I'm going to ask each of you very quickly, how would you grade the performance of President Joe Biden so far regarding this crisis from A, a success, to F, a failure. Charlie, I'm gonna start with you. C minus. I General. think it's got some, he can redeem himself, but he's gotta, he's gotta, he's gotta hurry up. General. It's an incomplete, Huel. Uh, it's too soon to say he's been in office for six months. Uh, this operation is still ongoing. Whether it's a success or not, uh, it can't be, can't be said at this point. Uh, I don't think it's a failure because there was an attack on our troops. I think that was to be expected, and perhaps it should have, we should have expected more by doing more force, force protection. Professor Khan. I'll agree uh, with Mr. McDaniel. Uh, an incomplete for President Biden, but for American policy in Afghanistan for the last 42 years, uh, I would give it an F, and I think we're seeing the expulsion right now. Andy. So our, I'm going to look at our national security policy. Traditionally, historically, it's short-sighted. It's political. I'm going to give Biden, Trump, Obama, Bush, and every other politician an F. Short-sighted and, and not really going to the heart of protecting this country. Jerry. We were focusing on President Biden and the, uh, the withdrawal. It's a D. And simply for the fact that the NEO should have been conducted before the withdrawal with consideration of our Afghan partners. He may be able to turn it around if he has the intestinal fortitude and the will to put enough force in there to make it, to make it happen. All right, panel, we thank you for your comments and your insights.
We know this is difficult, but we appreciate your expertise and your knowledge of what's going on. All right, coming up, we're gonna talk about the FBI's recent raid on the homes and offices of two Detroit City Council members. What's really behind it all? That and more, as Let It Rip continues. All right, welcome back to Let It Rip. With us right now, consultant, longtime political insider, Karen Dumas, activist, pastor, and political advisor, the right Reverend Horace Sheffield. You've already met Charlie and Andy, but we begin with former Fox 2 investigative reporter, M.L. Elmick, who also happens to be a candidate for the Detroit City Council in District 4. Now, to be fair, we invited his opponent, Letitia Johnson, to appear tonight. She respectfully declined, but we want her to know she is always welcome. So, M.L., You've been uncovering public corruption for years, so put on your reporter's cap right now. The FBI isn't saying much. What do you think they're looking for? Well, I, I think we heard uh, U.S. Attorney Barb McQuaid say the culture of corruption in Detroit was over 10 years ago. Clearly, that's not <clears throat> quite the case. We have two city council members, one of whom I exposed as a crook, uh, Gabe Leland, uh, Andre Spivey, who I exposed some of his, uh, his misconduct earlier. And he's one of the reasons I'm running for Detroit City Council, because I think we deserve city council members who put the people first. The uh, announcements yesterday were shocking. Uh, the timing is, uh, is surprising. And certainly these are two candidates who there hasn't been any suggestion that they've done anything illegal. But truly what we need to do to restore faith in our city government is to have people on city council where there's no question who comes first, the people. And where there's no question about what their priorities are. And so what we really need to do is get folks on city council who are there because they want to serve. And what happens with council members Benson and Ayers will be determined by the courts. It doesn't appear they're cooperating in any way, as uh, Councilman Spivey seems to be doing. So whether these charges are unfound or not, we'll know soon enough. But we have got to rebuild the city council with new people, we have got to restore public confidence in it because if we can't trust our government, we're lost. Well, Andy, ML mentioned timing. I was under the impression that there was an unwritten rule that the FBI would never go public with an investigation in the middle of an election cycle because the search itself could have an impact on the outcome. So why now? Well, ML mentioned a, uh, a press conference years ago where the former U.S. attorney made a statement about the culture. If you remember, ML, I think I said something like, tap the brakes on that. <laughs> we got a little bit of a history going on. So, yeah, Joel, that is the general rule within the Department of Justice. Uh, you you, you got to be very careful about coming uh, public with a public with a corruption investigation during an election cycle. That is the general policy. There's got to be something that's driving this. Look, the FBI did not get up yesterday morning and say, hey, let's go out and execute some search warrants for fun today, right? These warrants are done usually uh, closer to the end of the investigation than they are to the beginning. So they, uh, I, what it tells me is they're getting close. There was a reason that they had to kind of uh, kind of go around that general rule uh, and, and really make this thing public at this point. And obviously it was very public yesterday. Well, Karen, uh, Benson and Ayers are the apparent targets of these raids. No charges have been filed, but what impact did this raid have on the city as a whole and on the people now in charge? Well, like you said, uh, Huel, unfortunately, we've almost normalized corruption, not just in the city of Detroit, but in politics. Anytime you find power, you're going to find corruption because it can be very intoxicating for people that are not accustomed to it. You know, it doesn't pay very well. You have people that are, you know, constantly after you. And, and you know, ML said that, you know, we need to restore, you know, integrity uh, into these offices. But people have, you know, there's a difference between being a politician and a public servant. The process isn't conducive, you know, for people to go in and change a system that is just plagued by, um, I don't inefficiencies. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy. And I have to say this, you know, everybody's not a day being, you know, he was accustomed to notoriety, uh, you know, wealth. And so those things were not, you know, anything that would entice in him. Um, I was more taken aback, to be honest with you, by the neighbor that was quoted in the story down the street from Janae Ayers that said she'd never met her. And I'm thinking, how can you be an elected office and your neighbors don't know who you are? They have to recognize you from 
um, you know, a photograph. You know, I started looking back at some other information and, you know, Scott Benson had been pushing back on, you know, um, towing ordinance reform that Brenda Jones had been encouraging. So now all these things are starting to look, you know, just a little suspicious. How it's going to impact them, that's yet to be seen. And yet Karen Ayers was the top vote, vote getter in the at-large race and Benson was running unopposed. Reverend Sheffield, you know just about everybody at City Hall. Your daughter, Mary Sheffield, is the president pro tem of the council. So what do you think is going on? Do you well, see number a line? One, Go ahead. Yeah, well, number one, she hadn't gotten any money from Gasper. Uh, uh, we know that for a fact. I now, mean, we you know, say, who, who's Gasper? Who Gasper? Who? Well, Gasper's Fiore is the one is, that that is a towing uh, magnet that's behind most of what we've seen here, um, and you know that's very lucrative. I think some of the changes that were supposed to be made, the final one wasn't made, which may have allowed for this continuation of trying to influence folks for votes. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I had a tow situation. We used to talk about two, three hundred dollars, and the money's being split between the city. Uh, and the tow operator, that's a, that's a very in, uh, inducing kind of operation. So, look, I think, you know, we need to wait and see what really happens. I do have concerns about it being announced uh, in the middle of an election. But, you know, ML, by the way, who's gone from reporting now is going to be reported on. And we do know from him that everything is not always right. I remember the story reported about my daughter, Lieutenant Wendell's. And it was uh, it was Ken Cockrell's car, not hers. So sometimes, you know, uh, we get ahead of ourselves. I mean, if, if in fact this is true, I mean, it's, it's another dark day for the city of Detroit. I just want to get to the point where, you know, we're not always talking about, you know, things happening with Detroit politicians. By the way, there are folks outside of Detroit who've been involved in things as well. But this is a very difficult one. It also casts some light, I think, on the mayor in some regards. These are people who support the mayor. Uh, although he's been very clear that he's not a target and he's not involved in any of this, we really got to reform how they do business with respect to tow. Other than that, more folks going to be in tow right to the jail. But Charlie, as a reporter, you've interviewed Benson and Ayers several times over the years, but I bet they didn't call you back yesterday. As an attorney, <laughs> is that what you would advise your clients to do? Shut up and say nothing? I did call both of them yesterday. They didn't call me back, but uh, who knows? Maybe they're calling me now. I, I listen. As an attorney, I would say don't they do do not talk to anybody. That is the best rule we've ever had: the right to remain silent. Let Even them, if I know I'm innocent, shouldn't I proclaim yes. that innocence? Yes, but here's the difference with these people, though. Listen, ML is a candidate, so you know what? And he's going to say uh, that you know you have to go out and you have to. If you're going to represent the public, you have to communicate with the republic, with the public. I would normally say to a client that is as the subject of an FBI search warrant, don't say anything. None. Zero. However, I do think these people now, in the middle of this election cycle, I think timing is definitely suspect here. They should say something if they want to get reelected. And I don't think they say nothing. It's going to be asked. They can't hide. This is not that big a city. They And we're not done yet. So they have to say something. But it's got to be very generic. And they have to say something that is not going to get them in trouble. And they should probably be talking to a lawyer. Whether it's me or not, it should be yeah. up right and now. Andy, and Andy, Andy, before we go, some say that there's a racial component to all of this, that the FBI goes after Detroit politicians much harder than anyone else. How would you respond to that? Well, first of all, a decision to, to execute search warrants you know, at this time, that's going to be made by Washington, Maine Justice. That's not a local decision. But secondly, you, you and I talked about this. I had a discussion with Wendell Anthony many years ago. When I was in Youngstown, Ohio, the, the largest public corruption investigation in the history of this country, in the history of the FBI, 72 public officials convicted in three years. Everyone was white. You got it. the FBI is just equal opportunity, right? They don't really care if if, if you're if you're um, betraying the public trust, you're going to go down. And so and that, I think, mm -hmm. um, it, it, yeah. But people tell me that I, look, it, it's a it's a racist to say that that Detroit uh, has been a corrupt since Coleman Young. Detroit's been corrupt for centuries. I mean, it's it, 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 that's a racist statement. So um, it, it, they're equal. They're equal opportunity. They don't care. And let us not forget all of the convictions that the feds have accomplished in Macomb County as well. All right, panel, we thank you for your comments and your insights. We're going to close it out when we come back. Stay with us. Tell you what, despite the fact that the FBI is searching around for these people, they are innocent at this time until proven guilty. Remember that. And that's this edition of Letter Ring. Thanks for watching.